1938 seems to be the magic year to set movies based on pulp sand movie serials. Both The Phantom and The Rocketeer are set in that year, and they have a lot of things in common, but they're also both quite different. Both are trying to capture the spirit of the serials, with a heavy emphasis on adventure, characters that are mostly archetypes, a daring action hero fighting a dastardly villain, and some important artifact everybody's after. The most obvious difference, of course, is that The Rocketeer is set in 1938, but its source material is from the early 80s, while The Phantom's comics were actually published during the time period it's set in. Thus, it would have been really easy for the filmmakers to update this material and had a Phantom character in the mid-90s. In fact, it wouldn't even be entirely against the premise of The Phantom, since each Phantom is a descendant in a long line that goes back 400 years. A Phantom set later could simply be the offspring of the Kit Walker from the comics, and in fact, since this film was release, that kind of thing has been done on screen. A new descendant of Kits has been the Phantom in the animated series Phantom 2040, released just after this movie, and in 2008, the Sci-Fi Channel did a Phantom miniseries, and that Phantom is indeed the son of the characters Kit and Diana, whom we see in this film. The premise is simple but intriguing. The Phantom is a legend, believed by those who have seen him, especially pirates and other evil men, to be a ghost. He is nicknamed the Ghost Who Walks. Stories are told by men who have killed the Phantom, only to find themselves thwarted by him again later. But the Phantom is not supernatural. The mantle has been passed down from father to son for 400 years, since the first, a little boy who watched his father get killed by pirates, swore vengeance on them and all other evils. So this Kit Walker is the 21st Phantom, and his father too was killed killed in the movie by Drax's main henchman Quill, giving him, of course, that much-needed personal stake. While not supernatural himself, he does periodically get advice from the ghost of his father. This being a universe where the fantastic is possible, but the fandom himself is not fantastic, besides his ability to be good at darn near everything. I like how we see him take beatings and bleed. Trying to convince everyone you're a ghost isn't easy, and just to finish out this quick little plot setup, Drax, the evil businessman, is trying to get his hand on three skulls that will give him some sort of incredible power, and the Phantom goes through all kinds of adventures trying to find the skulls himself and stop Drax. Like the Rocketeer, there was a very specific vision in mind for this movie, and it shows. The Phantom is trying to be a movie serial, except of course that it's presented as a feature-length film. But unlike the Rocketeer, it doesn't really present us with any social commentary through the lens of the time. The Rocketeer had Nazis and movie stars and used them to talk about the nature of Hollywood and acting. There are no Nazis in The Phantom, and World War II feels very far away. The Phantom creates a much more literal, serialized universe. It really knows what these movies were like, and it seems to be defined. Them. While The Rocketeer was nostalgic for this period, it still felt it necessary to turn some tropes on their heads, to really make it its own, through examples I mentioned in my Rocketeer review, especially giving us that examination of Hollywood and making sure its female lead wasn't too stereotypical. Not The Phantom, though. It takes the serial rulebook and largely, though not completely, forgets all about modern storytelling. Its goal seems to be twofold. Make a Phantom movie that's true to its source material, and show a new audience why people like the old movie serials. In my Rocketeer review, I said the frustrating thing about it was deciding if certain ideas in the film were really problems, or if they were acceptable because it was in this serial-slash-pulp style. The Phantom, too, would be riddled with issues if I were to look at it strictly like any other story. But to do that would be to miss the point. This movie isn't about story arcs or subtext or deep character development or any of that stuff, because that's not what the serials were about. They were the appetizer before the main course, something to wet your palate for the feature and to keep you coming back to the theater each week so you could see how the hero got out of whatever horrible predicament after the cliffhanger. And it should be noted that Adam West Batman paid homage to this tradition weekly by splitting into two episodes tied together by a cliffhanger. The point of them was escapism. You left your complicated life to get sucked into a more simple reality, one in which right and wrong were clear cut and the good guys always won even if it took 12 episodes. Feature-length movies could do all that important literary stuff. These were for the action and adventure. And since The Phantom's story is mostly one action scene after another, this movie could easily be broken up into episodes and work wonderfully as a serialized adventure. The Phantom's characters are archetypes. Its plot is cookie-cutter, its villain, though entertaining, doesn't command sympathy and respect, and The Phantom is not a deeply complicated protagonist who grows and has an opportunity for change. And yet, the film works. The Phantom gets away with breaking these rules, partly because it's done in that old tradition, but also because it acknowledges that it's breaking these rules. It often borders on parody. It does all of this in a tongue-in-cheek way. It's not a movie designed to make you think, but it's obvious the filmmakers were thinking, because it does come off as a smartly made movie. 
Parody comes with a different set of rules than regular storytelling, because the point is to cleverly poke fun of someone else's work while making something entertaining that stands on its own, and The Phantom, while not a laughs-a-minute parody, does this in subtle and creative ways. Periodically, its characters seem to have to remind themselves that they live in a world of movie serials or in a pulp magazine, and that the rules are different than they would be in the real 1938. The Phantom, like all good pulp action heroes, is good at everything. I mean everything. He can ride horses, he can wield dual firearms, he's an expert swimmer, he's good at hand-to-hand -hand combat, he can fly airplanes, and while watching the film, I was going to be really disappointed if, after all this chivalry and Errol Flynn-esque swashbuckling type dialogue, he never had a good sword fight, and was pleasantly rewarded in the final act when he did just that. When he rescues Diana from Drax's henchmen, he climbs into an airplane. At first she's surprised and she says, you can fly a plane? Oh, of course you can. Why do I ask? The movie comes right out and says, yeah, yeah, we know there's no way a real person could do all this stuff, but remember what you're watching. So just for good measure, when the plane springs a gas leak after the thugs shoot at it for a while, the Phantom and Diana both drop onto a horse and ride away, the Phantom calmly in control of the whole situation. And another great tongue-in-cheek joke comes right after this. After everything they've just been through, Diana tells the Phantom she's dizzy, and he replies with, must be the humidity. After being shot at and dropping onto a horse from the plane, it must be the humidity. Another fun example at the film poking fun of the genre is when Quill complains that his men can't hit anything no matter how many times they fire their guns. This guy never breaks a sweat. His constant politeness is played up all the way through the movie. When he's in costume, he almost always has a smile on his face, and he has a plan for everything. Billy Zane carries himself a lot like the Lone Ranger, and he looks like he's really enjoying the role. Apparently, he had recently become a fan of the character before the part even came up, and so when he landed the role, he carefully studied the comics so he could carry himself like the Phantom does there, so far as to base his poses on those in the panels. It pays off. His performance really helps sell the material. It's a great-looking movie, and it feels very much like the 30s. There are numerous pans across city streets designed to make us long for a simpler time. The buildings and the cars look fantastic. And while I think The Rocketeer has a better script, The Phantom most certainly has a better grasp on special effects and stunt work, but to be fair, it was also released a few years later. Everything The Phantom does looks very real, and the stunts are breathtaking and believable. But even while the time period is clearly established, it doesn't rely on a lot of historical references for its story, though Drax does have a speech where he subtly makes a mention of the stock market crash. Again, this is about escapism, so it's a very safe story. The villain is an evil rich businessman. Everybody hates those! He hires the mob, like the villain in The Rocketeer, and you gotta have the mob in a 30s movie, but still, it's timeless and it's safe. Everybody hates the mob, too! The movie concentrates more on the Phantom's mythos, including the Sang Brotherhood, the evil gang of pirates who killed the original Phantom's father, the rope people who live in the jungle and help the Phantom whenever he needs them, his pet wolf and sidekick Devil, who for my money doesn't get nearly enough screen time past the first act, his skull cave, where he keeps all his treasures, because of course he can't just be good at everything, he's also got to be rich, and most importantly, the history of the skulls and how we find they're connected to the Phantom. As we learn toward the end, there's actually a fourth skull that controls the other three, and it's the one the Phantom wears on his ring, so that's how he's able to defeat Drax. So the Phantom does learn something. It's just not really anything about himself, but rather about his legacy. Thematically, if the movie is about anything beyond the spirit of adventure and the classic good always triumphing over evil message, I'd say it's about legacy. Kit is the Phantom because all the men in his line before him have been the Phantom. He doesn't brood about it, he likes it. And while he's not a completely fleshed out three-dimensional character, we do see him suffer as the Phantom. We could see why he might not want to keep doing this gig, but he doesn't question it, because it's what's expected of him. Again, in another movie this might be problematic, but this is a pulp hero, a simple character who does the right thing no matter what, to show an example to all the kids in the audience looking up to him. The movie is telling us that by continuing as the Phantom, he's doing the right thing. Not because he has to be whatever his father tells him to be, but because he has the ability to stop bad people from doing bad things. We see the current descendant of Sang toward the end, and he too has a legacy. It's interesting that he proudly announces that he's the descendant of the evil Sang, as if being evil was the thing that made him great. So every Sang after him has led the Sang Brotherhood, and they have a legacy of being evil. And in a 1930s movie serial, you know what happens to you when you embrace a legacy of evil? You get eaten by sharks.
It's black and white. Good guys get to go on awesome adventures all day, be good at everything, and get the girl at the end. Or at least tell the girl he has plans on marrying her and then write off to be a superhero some more. And bad guys have to make plans from undisclosed locations, work with women who eventually turn on them and don't fall in love with them, and get killed by the end. All of them, be it by a shark or a mystic beam from an ancient skull or being blown up along with said skull. So no matter your family's legacy, you should probably refrain from being evil, or at the very least, going around gloating about how being evil is fun and awesome, which both Drax and Sang do. I also think this theme extends to a defense of the genre, as I postulated toward the beginning. The Phantom is timeless. He always dies, but another always takes his place. And each one is so similar, no one ever knows the difference. And good thing, too, because it'd be awful if one Phantom was just so bad at flying planes or riding horses or firing two guns at once that someone caught on to the fact that he's not the same guy and therefore probably not immortal. These stories about good versus evil are also timeless. The people who first put these stories on film are gone now, but they pass that legacy down to new generations, and perhaps it's their duty to keep the tradition alive. Sure, there's nothing groundbreaking about a movie like this, but it's an adventure. It's okay that it's not a deep, brilliant piece of film, because it knows it's not. And it knows that all films definitely shouldn't be just fun escapism about a good guy and a bad guy fighting over some skulls. But the point is, maybe these kinds of stories aren't outdated, and the current onslaught of superhero films is a testament to that idea. That's not to say that they all need to be some cookie-cutter formula. This movie was trying to recapture something from a very specific period. But I do think the tradition of the Phantom is perhaps a metaphor for the tradition of adventure stories. And also keep in mind that this movie was written by Jeffrey Bohm, who wrote Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones being a franchise that also came out of the same tradition. The Phantom has a really fun villain in Xander Drax. And how's that for a consummate villain name, beginning and ending with the letter X? Oh, and a goofy bit of trivia. The Phantom's love interest is played by Christy Swanson, who played Buffy in the original 1992 Buffy the Vampire Slayer film. And the villain in the movie happens to be named Xander. And this is a year before the Buffy series started, so it's entirely coincidence. Anyway, Drax is over-the-top evil. He wants those skulls because he likes power. He doesn't even know exactly what they'll do. He's just heard they're mystical and evil and can make them powerful, so he wants them. He's that villain with no background, so you have no idea how he got like this, and he really seems like it's all just a big fun ride to him. He stereotypically kills anyone who turns on him or doesn't do their job well enough, and then promptly moves on to the next thing. In one scene, he reveals his scheme to nab the skulls, and the big mob boss refuses, saying this just doesn't sound right. I used to be an altar boy, he says. The only power I believe in comes from the barrel of a gun. And Drax responds by smiling and then throwing a spear into his bag. Then he just goes on with the rest of the meeting. He has a lot of the best and funniest lines of the movie. When he finds the second skull and it lights up to show him where to find the third, he yells, I love this! And shortly after, when the skull reveals where they'll be going, he says to his henchman, Did you hear the good news? We're going to Devil's Vortex! Which is, by the way, like the Bermuda Triangle in that ships keep disappearing there. And speaking of Buffy, he sometimes reminds me of the evil mayor who was the big bad in season 3, who was always well-spoken and polite, but also really evil and after a great power. He, of course, also had a lot more depth to him. There are some really silly plot points that I don't think are mistakes so much as kitschy decisions to make the facade of a big-budget action movie feel more like a serial. In the same scene where Drax gets the second skull from the museum, it shows him the location of the third by shooting a beam onto a map across the room. It's sure a good thing that map happened to be there. How else would it have told Drax where to go? And that's one smart skull, too, knowing what a map is and how to read it. And my favorite is when Kit takes off his mask in front of Diana. There is clearly black paint around his eyes, but when he takes the mask off, it's gone. That's some trick. You know, I think the Phantom does have a superpower. The thing that really doesn't work for me is Kit and Diana's romance, because there's a lot of talk about how the Phantom is in love with her, but we see very little of it. Apparently, several scenes establishing this were cut for time. It really comes off as Kit being in love with her because she's the girl in the script who isn't a henchwoman, and admittedly, that's probably how it would be in a real serial. You can see how something like this is tough to look at critically. But because the film seems to want us to be invested in this relationship, in a way it doesn't want us to care about Drax's background, it feels rushed. We get the somewhat standard superhero plot of they dated previously, but then he had to go off and become a superhero, so she never heard from him again. And I never care for this because it always makes the hero look bad. It doesn't make a lot of sense that while trying to protect a secret identity, you wouldn't call her up and make up some story to prevent her from looking for you, at the very least. 
Kit tries to keep the Phantom identity from her, but considering how good he is at everything else, it's a little perplexing how bad he is at this. It's not five minutes before he starts mentioning details about the skulls before he realizes there's no reason Kit Walker should know about that. And by the end, she reveals that she knows he's the Phantom. But since we haven't seen her with Kit much out of the costume, this comes out of nowhere and I'm just not invested enough in it to be impressed with her or surprised by the reveal. There's also a fun character, a taxi driver, who Kit pays in priceless jewels, and once he finds out how much they're worth, he follows Kit around and helps him out of jams. Eventually, he just kind of disappears from the movie, and I kind of wondered what happened to him. It would have been nice for his character to be paid off somehow by the end. I'm going to give The Phantom a 3 out of 4. It's not as smart as The Rocketeer or as interesting as another pulp hero movie made around the same time that I've reviewed, The Shadow, but it's truest to the serial tradition and is visually the most impressive of these. Ba, ba.